Gets to Lopez! And normally we're used to seeing the Hawks with those alley-oops. What a fight for Brook Lopez. Without Giannis, the Bucks still managed to beat the Hawks in Game 5. What did they prove? With Becky Hammond landing interviews for head coaching jobs, how soon will we see a woman as a head coach in the NBA? Kobe telling Devin Booker, be legendary. What are your expectations for Book in the finals? We'll discuss all that. So buckle up, friends, because you know what? Uh-oh. Half man, Woo. half amazing is on the show today. Let's get it. <laughs> Welcome back to The Jump. I'm Rachel Nichols. Today, my esteemed panel includes eight-time All-Star who played a record 22 seasons. And Vince Carter, I noticed you look good in that Raptors uni, and that was when you weren't playing with Richard. So He looks happier. There's, there's something there. Vince's former teammate, should I just introduce you that way, Richard? Yes, please. Right? That's how I'm known. No? You used to play with Vince Carter, didn't you? That's what everyone says. Richard Jefferson. <laughs> and, of course, our NBA champ, Kendrick Perkins, is in the house as well. Oh, Gentlemen, we got a smile from Perk. I'm Look, we got a yeah. smile so from happy Perk. to be with the three of you. Let's talk about the Eastern Conference Finals. The Bucks took game five last night. They were led in scoring by Brooke Lopez, who dropped 33 points. Dominant inside, and as he scored 26 on 13 of 14 shooting in the paint. Vince, we will start with you because that's your rook from your New Jersey days. What did yes. the Bucks prove to you in that win without Giannis last night? They proved that they can win and be successful playing out of the post. Look at all those circles. Look where he scored. He scored 26 points in the paint. And not only was it Brooke Lopez, it was Drew Holiday, it was Bobby Portis. They dominated and they played bully ball and they said, okay, we're not going to settle for three-point shots and play outside of the paint. We're going to play in the paint, beat these guys up, and oh yeah, we're going to defend and get block shots. And they were getting out in transition as well. So on all facets, in all facets of the game, they were dominating. Well, look, I, I have to agree with Vince from, from this standpoint. When you look at the Milwaukee Bucks, part of the frustration is their inability to kind of make adjustments. That's always been the thing. That's been one of the things that has followed Bud since his days in Atlanta. He's had great teams, great players, but does he make very good in-game and in-series adjustments? But this is something that people have been begging from the Bucks. You have Brooke Lopez. You have this size play <laughs> inside. He only shot a couple of threes. We know that this is not a formula for every single night for Brooke Lopez. That's not how the Bucks play because it allows uh, that spacing for Giannis to work. But there are certain days where there is a clear advantage that Brooke Lopez had and on, to, uh, on this night. It wasn't just him, but they could beat you up inside the paint. That is something that isn't utilized nearly enough. Well, well you know what, Rachel and Vince, I'm very disappointed right now. I'm very disappointed in our producer, Steve. Wow. Hillary, wow. Nathan wow. Gray, Danny, Carlos. I'm disappointed because you know why? Yesterday when I came on the show, at the start of the show, they pulled up receipts. And they and, and it was receipts of making Squidward look good. I mean, he was right about <laughs> what he said and whatever the case may be. But yesterday when we were on the show and I was talking about, you know, Trey Young being more valuable in this series – then Giannis, and he, and he hurry up and said, here's why you're wrong. That's true. And it turned out you speak the last truth? night showed, showed, showed the world why I was right. <laughs> I just want y'all to pull up the receipts on RJ as well. But listen, here's the thing. Thank you for getting to Brooke the question. Brooke Lopez can't play in the inside <laughs> when Giannis is on the floor. That's just, that's period point blank. So the thing that I saw last night was I saw a team playing together on the offensive end. It was body movement, it was ball movement, and it was, you know, passing up good shots to get great shots. When Giannis is not on the floor, we can see the Brook Lopez of old, a former all-star dominating the paint, play around the perimeter. But when you have Giannis back on the floor, remember, Giannis is handling the ball at the top of the key, and everyone else is what? They're spacing out, even Brook Lopez, so that's doing a disservice to him. But last night, Brooke Lopez changed back the hands of times, like I said <laughs> yesterday on the show. Chris Middleton showed us why he's a Batman in my eyes because he almost notched a triple-double. He did it in every form and fashion. 
25 or 26 points, 13 rebounds down there with the trees, and eight dimes. He was dishing that thing out everywhere. I just want to give my apology before this is a segment here from Richard Jefferson for saying I was wrong when I was right the whole time. Trey Young not playing on the road hurts the Atlanta Hawks. Yes. We cannot get fooled by game four because we all know role players play better at home. At home. Superstars play better at home and on the road. So what do you have to say about that, Squidward? Okay, let, just I'll make it I'll make it quick. The, uh, the no, the conversation. You take as long no, as no, no, but, but no, but but, but Vince, Vince, I don't know if you were aware, but but the conversation was this: which okay. one is a bigger impact? And I truly believe that Giannis's injury actually will impact who wins the NBA championship. Where Trey Young might impact who wins this series. I think that is a very different thing. That's all I'm saying, Perk. But I don't think you needed to go down the line and call out every single producer. You could have just called out Carlos and left it there. <laughs> You could have just called oh, him out. Yeah. Just left everybody else out of it. We love you, Carlos. Love you, Carlos. Look, <laughs> I did think the point you made somewhere in there, like three, eight minutes ago, Richard, about adjustments. It is interesting to me that you are right. It's certainly something the Milwaukee Bucks as a team were criticized for last year once they reached the playoffs, and that Bud has been tagged for in his career, again, going back to Atlanta. But the adjustment they made last night, was not one of the adjustments that they then spent this entire season practicing, right? Because they were working on so many new things during the season and being more flexible as a team with their schemes, that's how they ended up being the third seed instead of being the number one seed that they had been in previous years. Well, guess what? All of that practice is not what led to last night because they never practiced without Giannis, right? Mm -hmm. So it was interesting to me that they made this adjustment completely on the fly. And it talks about a mindset change in the Milwaukee Bucks that may be a little bit different than just some of the scheming changes that we've been talking about all season. I do want to get uh, to the Hawks because your point. I just want to say real, th- oh, yeah, thing, ahead, real quick. Yeah. Uh, my only question is, where, where do they go from here, though? That's right. my only question. If Giannis does play and come back, where do you go? How do you play now? Do you still feature Brooke in, in the post? Because if you're featuring Brooke in the post, if whoever is guarding so Capella, I'm like, please, I'm going to sag. Please, Giannis, shoot the three right. for me. That's settle. Settle right. for that. You yeah, know? yeah. So I, I, I'm just curious to see where do they go from here? Yeah, Giannis might not play game six. That might be a good thing for them. But if he plays, how do they respond or how do they play from there? I do think it's possible that the win last night bought Giannis an extra game to take off, some extra rest. Now, True. we don't know the specifics of his injury enough to know if they're even thinking in days. It might be a multi-week thing. It might be a longer thing. It might be a shorter thing. But if it is a day-to-day sort of situation, if you know you have game seven on your home floor, if you need it, and you look at the way the game went last night, you might be telling Giannis, okay, man, it's not critical. It's not do or die. Let's give it an extra couple days. Perhaps that's what's going on in Milwaukee. I do know in Atlanta, it is critical. They are on the Mm -hmm. brink of elimination. And you're talking about Trey Young being so important, guys. It was his second straight game with that bone bruise in his foot. We saw him grimacing as he tested it out on the court before the game. So he just was not able to go. Perk, seeing as you have proclaimed from the mountaintop that Trey Young is everything to this team, How cautious should Atlanta be with their young superstar, especially since, and Vince, I'm sure you're going to chime in with this, we know Trey, if if he can play, he's going to try to play. So what do you think the franchise should do in terms of his overall health? Well, I think they should sit him out for the rest of the postseason. I mean, especially this series, for the simple fact he's 22 years old, right? It's going to be a short turnaround. You don't want to risk anything any other type of injuries. On top of that, watching him in the pregame and watching him go through the little shoot around or pregame warm up, he was in pain. So I don't see a big difference of in 48 hours that's going to help the situation. He's still going to be in pain for game six if they test it out. So I will protect this young superstar by all means necessary. Right now, they overachieved, in my opinion. The Hawks have something to build on. They're in the Eastern Conference Finals. Trey Young, this was his coming out party. He put the world on notice. If they lose this series uh, uh, to the Bucks, no one would care. They would still give the Hawks their flowers along with Trey Young. I would sit them out for the rest of this series. Hmm. I would say this. If we're in the fire as players, um, 
we're that close to an opportunity to, to, to play in the finals. You want to see what you can get out of him as the players, out, out, of, your, out of yourself if you're injured as, for Trey Young. So uh, me, I say, I understand what you're saying, Perkins sitting them down. But my thing is, let's just see what 48 hours does for him. Mm-hmm. That's all I'm saying. Mm-hmm. And, 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 th- and then from there, they evaluate him. And then you save that player from himself. We've talked about that. I've heard you all say it before. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we need the organization to step in and save us as players from ourselves. Because, yeah, by any means, Anthony Davis, he wanted to go play. KD, a couple of years ago in the finals, wanted, I mean, the, the yeah. yeah, in the finals. finals, wanted to go play and hurt <laughs> himself. So, you know, sometimes we need it. But you, you go out there and you see where you are and they have to make the tough decision for him sometimes. Like, hey, Trey, we see you grimacing a little too much. We need to sit you out and, you know, and see what game six go- brings us. And hopefully game seven, we try it again. But, I, I, yes, I, his energy, what Trey brings to the table is important. I say to him, Trey, you do everything you need to do in, uh, up until game day. Get your butt in the gym early. Mm-hmm. Go, in the, go out there, test it out early, behind the scenes. Right. Not in front of the cameras, behind the scenes. Get your work in. If it's not, go back, get some treatment, then come back out in your shooting time, and you go from there, and the decision should be made then. Now, this is what I like about Trey, and I think why the basketball world, not just the the fans have fallen in love with the little guy that can do all the things. The reason why the basketball community, all the guys here on this chain, Rachel, everybody, is because Trey puts himself in a position of eliteness. He looks around and sees James Harden hobbled and trying. He goes out there and sees Anthony Davis hobbled and trying. He sees Chris Paul, and he considers himself, which he is, one of those guys. And I think that's the hardest part. He looks at Anthony Davis and says, I expect, I, I believe that I am one of the top players in this league, and this is what top players do. They will go out and they will risk it all in these moments. And so that's why I have so much respect for him. But if he can't go, he can't go. But I do know this. As Trey continues to progress in his career and progress in opportunities, I know this. If there's any opportunity for Trey to get out there, he will because he considers and he's looked at the great players that are playing today that have tried their best and have done everything, and that's what he's trying to do. Can I be the Anthony Davis that does something? Well, Anthony Davis ended up being hurt. Can I be the James Harden? Well, well James Harden did his best, but he wasn't there. Well, that's a, the, sometimes those gestures well, actually mean something. And that's like, what he's not, trying to do. I, I, yeah. In my opinion, it's not fake hustle to do it in front of other people. No. It's that it actually means something to the rest of the guys. He got on the court, not the back court in the back with the trainers, but he came out with us onto this court, tried to shoot on this basket we will be shooting on all night, and, and he couldn't, but he tried. He made it that close. And I do think psychologically means something. it does matter. I don't know. You guys played, but it, I see it on guys' faces when the other guy is out there. Hmm. Well, so. well th- th- this is the problem that I have with what y'all are saying. When, we t- <laughs> when people were talking about Anthony Davis and questioning whether or not he should play or give it a shot, he went out there for five minutes. Five minutes, and then all of a sudden the world blew up, and everybody was like, the training staff, the doctors over there, they need to be fired for putting them in position to go out there on the court and look that way. The same with James Harden, in my opinion. James Harden had no reason to be out there on the floor. He was not even 50%. The man couldn't even finish in transition when he had wide open breaks he had to pull up because his hamstring wouldn't let him. All I'm saying is Trey Young going out there for five for five minutes and he's hobbling. What is that proving to the – what is I, that I, I, proving I, 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 to anybody? We didn't say he should go you, play. We, we, we agree. We, agree with we were you. only talking about warming up. And do you do it in the back or do you do it in front of people? Yeah, like do you, quote, try to go – in front of people or alone, and that sometimes doing it in front of people, just the act of sitting there in your full warm-ups, well, not in a game, yeah. but trying to sort of see well, your your movements in front like of people. Somebody took well, I'll say this: win. these guys know if that player is is actually working out and, and, yeah. and preparing themselves. You know, I, I, for me, sometimes I feel like it doesn't. Ha- it can be behind the scenes. Yeah. It doesn't have to be on that court because a, sometimes you know you want to keep you know everybody out of what's going on. But the effort and the attempt, and if it's not there, it's not there, Perk. And that's where we go into belief to, to what you're saying, Perk. Yeah, if that guy's not ready, he's not ready. He's not you know, ready. That's, but the organization has to step in and say, no, 
save him from future injuries. I certainly, you know, look, we only we only know what we see and hear in public. It certainly seemed like that's what happened in the last game. I mean, Trey was trying and trying and trying yeah. and trying. And, and it they felt made a like, decision not to. It felt like it they right. were like, right decision. yeah, OK, young guy, young fellow, like we're, we're good. Um, and in fact, they were good without him uh, last night. Not as much. So it will be interesting to see what happens in their elimination game just tomorrow night. <laughs> All right. Coming up. What, what, what? Welcome back to The Jump. Rachel Nichols joined by Richard Jefferson, Kendrick Perkins, and Vince Carter. And guys, we still have a few head coaching vacancies open. Doris Burke went on the Posted Up podcast with our friend Chris Haynes of Yahoo Sports, and they spoke about Becky Hammond's candidacy to be a head coach in this league. Take a listen. I have heard, and we all know, we both know many assistant coaches across this league who do a phenomenal job and get interviews. And in the process, not one time have I ever heard when somebody, and I'm not, I won't mention a specific name because I can't even bring one instance to, to, to bear here where I've heard ex assistant coach didn't get the job where the uh, likability and the work ethic was in play for an assistant coach. Not one time have I ever heard that. So why were Becky handed, uh, Becky Hammond's candidacy was in play? Did we hear about her likability? I've just never heard that. We've heard it as it relates to players in terms of like James Harden, a little bit now, Luka Doncic. Do people want to play with him? Um, we've heard relationship situations, right, where perhaps in a head coaching situation, Rick Carlisle didn't get along with Luka. I just, I, you know, if you're going to evaluate a woman, evaluate her to the same standards that you are evaluating your male candidacy. Look, and, and what Doris is talking about, any woman watching this show understands the point she is making because there are all the code words, right? We know the code words. Yeah. She's too ambitious, which if it was a man, nobody ever said that about a man. She's not likable. Nobody ever said that about a male authority figure coach. In fact, we see men sometimes criticized for being too close or too palsy with people. You're supposed to be strong and be a voice of authority. And it's just one of those things where some of these same exact words that are used as compliments for men, the idea that they are then reasons to not hire someone if you're a woman, it cuts very deep. It's very, very hard. And, and, and Vince, we do see there are still a few open jobs. I've been talking about Teresa Witherspoon in New Orleans because she already works for that organization and already has a close relationship with a lot of, of players down there. And her credentials as a player herself are just impeccable. Um, whether it is her there or whether it's Becky Hammond somewhere else, whether it's Kara Lawson, who, to me, I would have loved to see her in Boston. I'm not saying they didn't make a good choice there, but yeah. to me, Kara Lawson would have been a great fit in Boston where she had already been an assistant coach. How close are we, Vince, to seeing a woman as a head coach in the NBA? Well, I'm going to say this first. I've got the opportunity to, to talk with, and I know oh. Teresa Weatherspoon, she, could, she demands and commands a locker room. Amen. So they're gonna listen. She's not afraid of anyone, Team you know, and spoon. she'll get in your Team face. Spoon. And yeah, Team spoon. yeah, it's Team nothing. Spoon. I mean, she's not afraid, and I think you know players will benefit from her. But I think we're close. Uh, I mean, we, we've gone from you know in the last ten years to not even talking about uh, a female sure. having the option to get an interview to where we are now. And all Becky Hammond is doing is breaking down barriers and kicking the door down. And she will have that opportunity sooner than later because she does a great job. Uh, Popovich, you know, I, one thing I love about Popovich is he will sacrifice uh, uh, the double technical thrown out to give his coaching staff an opportunity to grow yes. and be in that number one <laughs> position. And you've seen her com uh, command and take control of that team when she had that opportunity, just like she did in summer league. So uh, shots out to, you know, to Greg Popovich, first and foremost, for doing that for his players. He did it for Jock Vaughn. Mm -hmm. And jo you see Jock Vaughn got a job. I think she was going to get that opportunity sooner than later. Well, I, I hope. But one thing I want to talk about is you can hear, sometimes you might think that it's passion, but that was pain in Doris, Book, in Doris Burke's voice. Absolutely. Board. I could not that, was, that, was, that was pain. Like, that was not passion. That was just, she knows what it takes to break down barriers. She knows what it takes to be in that position. So when she's talking about that, she is also talking about her own experience <clears throat> of getting to the mountaintop as one of the great broadcasters in sports history. And so she knows what it took to get there. So when she sees other women, 
women going through that, it becomes that much more difficult for her. We want to talk about likability. I was playing for the Nets when Becky Hammond was playing for the Liberty. So we would interact with each mm-hmm. other. I would play for the San Antonio Spurs when she was in San Antonio and, and, and starting to build that portion of her career. She's an amazing person. She, I, I've had coaches that I didn't like, and Becky was somebody that you're excited to see because you, one, know she's a baller. She respects the game and she puts in the time. So when you start hearing these negative cold words thrown out there, I can understand why it'd be so disheartening. But the time is coming. There will be a time very, very shortly, in my opinion. But it's going to take somebody to go out on an edge. It's going to take a GM. It's going to take a president. And it's going to take an order to say, like, hey, if this is the best candidate, let's give it. Let's go. If she's qualified, give it to her. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, what I was going to say is, it's just, I think it's just beautiful to even be talking about this situation because we wouldn't have even been talking about this 20 years ago. And the fact that this is, this is even a conversation, I think is a good thing. I think, uh, I don't know the timetable of it, but I will say this. This is the only thing, the only barrier I think that will be hard. And I think for, for, for us like, uh, Becky Hammond or Teresa Weatherspoon across is that respect level of the locker room. And I say that because of this. We're dealing in the, in the, in the NBA right now where guys are getting paid $39, $40 million a year. Guys are like, you know, alphas and divas, right? We're dealing with NBA guys that are actually divas of franchises. And so with that being said, it's hard for males to demand respect in the locker room right now in the NBA. And I'm not saying a woman can't, but I think the way that coaching searches and coaching hires are going about when they are when, when GMs and front offices are actually indulging and talking with their franchise players, it's gonna to have to be a franchise guy or the fran- two franchise players of that organization endorse a woman heavily and say, We want her as our head coach. Where it puts the, where it puts ownership on the organization and the the organization in whole to say they want to, we're going to hire. That's exactly right, Perk. And, and I think that that will eventually happen. It'll just be interesting to see where. I, I do want to say before we move on, and we will, to what's going on in Dallas, but I'm watching those pictures and the video of Becky next to Coach Pop. Has anyone ever talked about Coach Pop's likability? Ah, whether right. he should be. God, right. No. Oh, no. Right. Just curious. Pop is, there's one thing that right. Pop, he's loved, but he ain't liked. Let me say that. No, let me. No, wait, wait. Not true. I, let me say this. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Before I get in like trouble. Greg Popovich. When that's I, not what we're talking about. No, no, no. About, Greg Popovich. We're talking about that him sort of going around a room and being like, "Do you like me? Before I get in trouble, before the trolls come out, what I'm saying is Greg Popovich is like your grandfather. He is job to love you. He, you're not supposed to like him. He's going to be a disciplinarian. And to your point, it's not like, well, Pop isn't likable. It's like, no. His job is to make sure that you're doing your job. And by the way, the way Pop is. His gruffness I is love considered him. an asset, is it He's, not? Yeah. Right? He's a military man. I love that dude. Right? I mean, that's that's just one of the things, again, it's the idea. And, and what, what Doris was talking about, too, was not all women are the same. Right? Yeah. And the idea that, hey, this woman, like Greg Popovich, may be a little bit more br- more gruff and, and her style is this way. Or this yeah. woman might be that way, just like yeah. the men are allowed to be different. Imagine <laughs> that. All right, Vince Carter, thank you so much for joining us today. You will be back throughout the NBA Finals. Coming up, though, we're going to talk a little bit about it is hard to overstate the influence that the late Kobe Bryant had on the current generation of NBA stars. This is especially true for Devin Booker. You probably heard a lot of Book and Kobe comparisons recently, and if you ask Devin Booker, that is no coincidence. He styles, his demeanor, his intensity, and his play, well, he does it all after the Mamba. We'll let Booker explain. Take a look. Booker from deep. Wow. Kobe. He's Booker, tough shot. Oh, great. We had a short conversation on the court, and then he left me with, meet me in the back. Let's chop it up for a little bit. Dream come true for Devin Booker to meet his hero, Kobe Bryant. I thought it was going to be a two to three minute combo and ended up being 15 to 20 minutes post game. And that's when he signed the shoes to me. One shoe said to the young one, the next one was to book, be legendary. I got be legendary tattered on my arm. That's something that Kobe left me with. Booker for three. It's good. Booker falling away. Got it again. 
It's a book of Bonanza! He also told me what I'm gonna have to do to become legendary. It's a constant pursuit. You have goals, you know the steps it takes to get there, and you can't shortcut any of them. That was the thing with Kobe. This is what I have to do to get that. Well, I'm gonna check off every box. Devin Booker on fire! That keeps you going, that keeps you driven every day. The days you don't feel like you have it, I look at my arm, I see a tight arm, and I'm like, well, it's time to get it today. I don't care how you feel, Book. You gotta be legendary today. Legendary stuff indeed from Devin Booker. I am here with Richard Jefferson, Kendrick Perkins. Guys, I'm sure you see the Booker and Kobe similarities and now Book is on the biggest stage possible, starting with Perk. What are your expectations for him in the finals? To continue to be great and to continue to be legendary. Here it is, right, Rachel? We already know that he can score with the best of them. You can drop him off anywhere in America, he's going to get buckets. That's what he do. But watching the, the uh, game six against the Clippers will show me that Book is ready for the moment was growth. Battling through the adversity of going against Patrick Beverly, one of the pesty defenders in the NBA today. But also watching how the Clippers had picked on him all series long on the defensive side of things. And I thought in game six, was his best defensive game. He stayed out of foul trouble. He guarded well. And then in the timeout, when he went to the huddle, it wasn't Chris Paul speaking. It wasn't Monty Williams speaking. It was Devin Booker being the leader in that huddle. So with all that said, I think he's going to continue to shine. He's going to continue to make Kobe proud. And the finals is just another stepping stone for him to show the world how great of a young star that this guy really is. In, you know, what I like about the, the whole connection there and the be legendary, and, and Perk knows this, and, you know, Vince was just here, there is a constant pursuit for greatness. And it mm. doesn't matter. And it's never being, never being satisfied. Kobe Bryant won championships early. We know about his failures. We know about his growth. We know about he's got to win one without Shaq. We know about all the things. And, and every day that Kobe Bryant woke up, he had something that was different than 99.9% .9 of the players to ever play. He was always just trying to get better. And if, and if Devin Booker takes on that persona of just like, doesn't matter. I'm always going to be hungry. I'm always going to try and be legendary or be better, then the future is bright. And I think this is just another step. Whether he he succeeds or whether he fails in the finals, he knows what it takes to get there. And it's a constant pursuit. And I think that's going to be something that's amazing to watch. It's going to be so much fun. And, and look, I just can't believe this is Book's first playoff series. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes that mm -hmm. registering... Playoff run, sorry, not playoff series, first playoff run. Thank you, Producer Steve. I'm thinking about him, I'm thinking about DeAndre Ayton, I'm thinking about the fact that two years ago, this team only won 19 games. Yeah. So we have teams around the league that have been rebuilding for how long, would you say? A decade plus, <laughs> about 15. There, there, right. just, I, I hear sometimes from some organizations, well, this is what a rebuild looks like. And, and certainly, look, there were plenty, Shout out James plenty, Jones, champ. plenty of years that the Suns were mired. Into, there's a reason that there were 10 years between playoff appearances for this team. But you do put the right people in the right places, and that turnaround can come a lot quicker. It does speak to James Jones, Monty Williams, and, and, and all of the players who have done so much to pull together and get them where they are. It's going to be such a good finals. I can't wait. All right, coming up next, who is the best? You were doing it. Don't stop. Kate Cunningham projected to be the number one pick in the draft by ESPN's draft expert, Jonathan Gavoni. Perk, is Cunningham a good potential fit for the Pistons? Absolutely. If they knew better, they'd do better. He, he's the for sure number one pick. Second coming of Grand Hill in my eyes. The hardest position to, to fill is that wing position. He's so versatile. He can score with the best of them. Great decision making. He's active on the defensive end. I love Kate Cunningham. He's going to be the number one pick. Look, I've heard from a ton of people, and the only thing that I know is everyone says it's a consensus number one. Everybody was waiting on that pick. We've got the same manager, uh, Naila Waterfield. we got the same agent, Jeff Schwartz. So yeah, no, I'm no, locked in. Nobody, nobody asked you, Perk. This is my time to talk. So I'm is excited it? to see what the kid does. Is it really? Perk, go ahead. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, Rachel, like, nobody cares. We talking about Kate Cunningham. We don't care if y'all have the same manager. Like, well, we don't care they, about that they, there's, there's the a connection. Orbit. It's not a Maybe. connection. Well, I, 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 here's, I will say, in non-COVID times, I'm back in 
perk here, so don't wave it. Oh, dang it. it. Um, <laughs> in non-COVID times, that might have meant more, but now that y'all can't hang out together still, I imagine. Have you hung out with Kate Cunningham? Let's well, the only thing I said, I was like, make sure that you sit down with me for your one-on-one interview before Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing. I'm you said, Ra- you I, didn't say that. I didn't say that. Because you, know you know what? Ra- that Rachel would be have been better at it. Decision. That would be the worst decision. It would be, but that's what makes it funny. That's what makes it funny. That's why I won't hold them to it. I would love to see that, actually. I think that would be a lot of fun. The Suns waiting to see who they will face in the finals, of course. The Bucks and Hawks heading to game six in Atlanta tomorrow. Phoenix and Milwaukee played two amazing games this season. Suns won both by just a single point. So I don't sleep on that matchup. Atlanta, meanwhile, split its season series with Phoenix. So, Perk, who do you think is a better matchup for the Suns in the finals? Well, if the Suns were to play the Hawks, Rachel, they would sweep them. I, I honestly believe that with Trey Young. Hmm. I think the better matchup, the more exciting matchup that would go seven games is the Milwaukee Bucks. Hmm. I think that would, that would be a fun series to watch just because they got equal talent. Right. Uh, well, I, I, look, I, I didn't know if he was done lying to the American people. Why? Uh, well, just because he's ta- he wants to just say seven games because he doesn't really want to give a definitive answer of he like. Did. Who's, he's, no, he he's said, just said the Bucks would be a better. But, but he says that he thinks the series is going to go seven, but that's not true. He knows that that's not true, but he just doesn't want to say that the Phoenix Suns well, are by far the best team. That that the best. Oh, close your mouth. Close your mouth. Shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> the Phoenix Suns are by far the Don't Phoenix Suns are by far the best team. They're the, by far the most healthy team. Whoever shows up in that finals against the Phoenix Suns, it's going to be a wrap. Rude. Rude. It's going to be a wrap. I, 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 look, the hardest part about this question is you don't know who constitutes either of these teams we're talking about because is Trey Young on that Hawks team? Is Giannis on that Bucks team? That would influence how you would answer the question. I personally think the idea of Trey Young and Devin Booker going back and forth across awesome. the court would be pretty killer. Yeah. Um, but also, it's a great storyline to see Giannis after all of the playoff sort of controversy. The last time he got this close to a finals was when they won two games of a conference finals against the Raptors and then, of course, lost the last four straight. So the story of him finally getting there and sort of trying to pay off those two MVPs, I think, would be really great. So I, I'm in for either of those, but I, I'm like the rest of America. Like, I want to see the stars play basketball. And right now it's hard that neither of them are playing in that series. Hey, Rachel, all I'm going to say is, look, go pull up my receipts on my predictions this postseason. I've been 90%, so RJ can say whatever he want. I can been say right whatever I want. Well, it's the 4th of July. How about you put that head down to the camera and show everybody that T-top coming? What? What? Why? Again, show, why? Show, but just show them. Not people get to see the 610. Show them the convertible coming, Perk. Yeah, show them the convertible. <laughs> just go like this once, Perk. Everyone else out there. Go like this, Perk. <laughs>